Hey there, and welcome to Reveal Truth. We have a two-part story for today. Both are equally satisfying, so don't get mad that it's split. Ready to dive in. Let's begin. Today, I watched my wife, well my ex-wife, across the club. She was partying gaily with our friends. Again, my ex-friends, the group of friends my wife and I used to be part of. Now they were with her, and with her new husband. The whole. I miss her. I miss the life that I had, waking up with the woman I loved, having good friends that I could count on, being a part of something. I'd never really had much of that as a kid. My mother died when I was five and my dad hit the road. He was a bum, a real bum, a hobo. Not a poor homeless guy. He chose his life and actually loved it. He was a hard gnarly man who rarely bathed, wore whatever rags he could find, until they were no longer fit even to be rags. He reveled in begging, handing sob stories to the suckers, as they handed him fives and tens and a rare but occasional twenty. He stand on the island at a busy intersection, holding his sign, proclaiming him a veteran, he wasn't, crippled, only mentally, or jobless and trying to feed his family. Well, he was jobless and did feed me, more or less regularly. Yes, he had taken me with him. Apparently, a young child holding your sad story sign is more effective than in the hands of a raggedy filthy man. He taught me a lot. By the time I was six, I could panhandle with the best of them, and knew the easiest marks immediately. I also was light-fingered, not just in the stores while the cashiers were busy watching my father, but in crowds where purses were being jostled, and a light touch wasn't noticed. I probably provided 75% of my family's funds. The family being my dad, myself, and whatever skunk my father could convince to sleep with him at the time. Surprisingly, his women were even filthier than he was, in every way. Oh, well, he'd say as he followed a particularly stinky pear mare into her tent, and he all poured in a storm. I was 10 when that life ended. I was no longer an innocent-looking little urchin, but a hard-looking punk who looked at least 5 years older than I was. Now sharp eyes watched me in stores and in crowds, and I was caught with my hand in a woman's purse. The cop's wife, no less. Her husband abbed me and arrested me on the spot. My father melted into the crowd. He'd been arrested before, and I always waited for him. One time, the longest time, I had to wait six months before he was released. But that was me. My father didn't wait. I guess he realized that I wouldn't be producing the income I had when I was younger. I never saw my father again. It was in jail that the social worker discovered that I had never been schooled. I was supposed to start kindergarten when my mother died, but my father and I hit the road before that started, so I had never set foot in a classroom. I couldn't read, had only a slight grasp of arithmetic that one develops when handling money, and absolutely no idea of any other school subject. My education had been entirely different. It didn't take long for the other kids in jail to realize I was a dummy. They left me alone once they found out that one of the things I'd learned on the road was how to fight dirty, and to be so vicious it wasn't worth going after me again. When I spit out the tip of one aggressor's nose the message got through to everyone. But it had the effect of isolating me. Since I'd never been around other children before, I had no clue as to how to act with them. With adults on the tramp, I'd always had to be wary and defensive, and had built up an attitude that put a wall around me, that discouraged any friendly kids from approaching me. The social worker assigned to my case, Miss Kittledge, was horrified at my background. Sounds bad but was lucky for me. Miss Kitty, as those who liked her called her, convinced the judge that I wasn't at fault for the emotional and physical abuse that made up my childhood, that I had never had the opportunity to learn right from wrong. In short, I shouldn't be punished for doing what my father had taught me. So, in the eyes of the law, I wasn't punished. I was released into foster care, where my luck seemed to run out. I'll spare you the story of abuse that foster kids are often subjected to, I dealt with it as my background had taught me, viciously. My first foster parents will bear marks on their faces for the rest of their lives, and I was back in jail. Miss Kitty saved me again. She, for some reason unknown to me to this day, had faith in me. She didn't believe the story the foster parents sling about the feral child that attacked them without reason. She dug into their history and talked to previous foster kids, and was able to piece together a horror story that she said made my upbringing look wholesome. Once again, she was able to convince the judge that I didn't belong in prison. In the end, she took me home. She fostered me, eventually adopting me. And she loved me. Something I had never had before. She was gentle, gentle with me like a horse whisperer with a wild colt. She didn't react when I lashed out in the confusion and anger that at the time made up my whole being. She taught me to trust, and to love. Miss Kitty's family had left her a trust fund which made her well off. She had become a social worker to give back, not because she needed the income. Now, she left her job and homeschooled me, fearing that I would react to teasing in a negative way, she was a smart woman. In a surprisingly short time, she had me reading at an 8th grade level, and had pushed me into college level reading within a year. 
On at 13, she had my IQ tested by the shrink that child welfare insisted I see. My IQ topped 160. To everyone's surprise I was a genius. At least on paper. Through my reading in Miss Kitty's lessons, I was rapidly mastering math through geometry and learning civics, history and elementary sciences through biology. But with social skills, I was still lacking. Being homeschooled I was again not around other kids. Miss Kitty tried to arrange play dates with children of friends and colleagues, but my protective walls, built over five years on the road, baffled other kids. Also, there were a couple of confrontations that didn't end well. I was like a wolf in a flock of sheep. After those incidents, Miss Kitty was hard-pressed to find kids for me to play with. She countered by having me take music and dance lessons, figuring a more defined environment would ease the social pressures on me. It did. I learned to play the guitar and piano, as well as how to dance. I would do everything from waltz to jitterbug, as well as the current dance trend, by the time I was 18. But the dance master reported to Miss Kitty that I had done it without speaking a word to my partners beyond the, would you like to dance? Before, and the thank you, after. But at 18 I had more than caught up in my studies. Junior year I was sent to a Catholic high school and end up mainly with AP classes. I could have done more extracurriculars, beyond the chess club, wrestling and boxing. Miss Kitty insisted I participate after school, and I found that very little social interaction was required in my chosen pursuits. And they were enough to get me into college, as I stood out in all three. Vicious has its advantages. Miss Kitty also sent me to karate classes, starting when I was being homeschooled, hoping that the philosophy expounded by Mr. Miyagi had some truth in it, and the karate disciple would help me temper my anger and reactions. To some degree it did. My dojo stresses thinking before action, then thinking again. There were less incidents. That why I was able to transfer to the Catholic high school. With Miss Kitty backing me, I didn't need a scholarship for college, but I got one to the Ivy Elite College that Miss Kitty had attended. She was so proud of me she wept and I wept. I was so grateful to this woman who was my whole life. She was my mother, my only friend, and my defender. Thank God. I thank God daily for bringing Miss Kitty into my life. Unfortunately, she didn't get to see me graduate with honors, Phi Beta Kappa. She did get to see me develop some social skills. In college I learned to date. Sex is a great motivator. I still hadn't developed any real male friendships, although my roommates were cordial enough. I just didn't know how to take it further. So, I never joined a frat, never had beer drinking buddies, never had a wingman. But a fit winning boxer had to make only minimal efforts to have a social life. Some girls just love the bad boy. Senior year I met Dorothy Halper. Dot, she said to call her. Kibling ran through my head, he would dot and carry one till the longest day was done. I would carry this one past the longest day. She was gorgeous. And she reminded me of Miss Kitty. That alone made me open my heart to her. Miss Kitty approved of Dot when she met her, for the first and last time, when I brought her home for the Thanksgiving vacation. They were like two peas in a pod, it seemed to me, and I beamed with love for them both. We planned to spend Christmas Day with Dot's family and New Year with Miss Kitty. Alas, it was not to be. Two days before Christmas while shopping for a present for Dot, Miss Kitty stepped off a curb downtown into the path of an idiot running the red light. My mother, my savior, was gone. Like that. In a second. I never got to say goodbye or give her the thanks she deserved. I shut myself away from everyone, including Dot, until Miss Kitty's lawyers dragged me out of the house to attend the reading of her will. Beyond a few gifts to servants and bequests to her charities, Miss Kitty left everything to me, including a letter. The lawyer told me that Miss Kitty's instructions were for me to read the letter at home when I was alone. Miss Kitty wanted to talk to me with my undivided attention, he said. That night I settled down at the kitchen table ready to hear Miss Kitty's final words to me. My dear Ryan, it began. I stopped reading as my eyes swelled up with tears. I could hear her. She always called me my dear Ryan, even when she was frustrated with me, or the rare times when I angered her through my willfulness or stubbornness. My dear Ryan, by now you know that I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and will soon pass away, I sat up, shocked. I hadn't known. Then I wondered, briefly, had she stepped in front of that car on purpose. No, she wasn't the type to avoid or run from a problem. And the next line gave lie to that idea. Well, as you're reading this letter, the disease has finally won, and I am not alive anymore. But no regrets, except having to leave you. I had hoped to see you grow into the man I know you will be. You have been through more in your short life than anyone I know or have read about, and you have come through it all remarkably well. Always know that, although you were 10 before we met, you are my son, and I am and have always been very proud of you. You have often told me that I saved you, but in truth you saved me. I was alone and lonelier than I ever knew before you came into my life. Loving you and having you in my life made me complete. But enough of that. 
You know that I love you, as I know you love me. But I worry about you. Well I think homeschooling you was the best thing for you at the time. I've worried that you were never socialized enough with people. When you're in a crowd, you always remind me of an angry bear waiting to lash out. It keeps everyone away from you and I worry you'll be lonely. I want you to work at making friends, for me. I know you don't like it, that it makes you uncomfortable, but do it for me. Please. I won't rest in the afterlife if you don't. Start listening to people, help people that need help. You used to tell me about being able to ID a mark in the crowd as a child. Use that skill to ID people who need help, and then help them. Be friendly and care. Care like I cared for you. Pay it forward. Please, for me. You are my heir. I've left almost all my wealth, as well as the family trust, to you. I know you use it wisely. My wealth was enough for our life and should be enough for yours. The trust I've always viewed as something to give back. I've used it to fund various charities and to help needy individuals. It's you to do with as you like, but I hope you'll follow my example. That much money can ruin a life or save many lives. I hope it doesn't ruin yours. My desire is for you to have a full life, full of friends and love. Do it for me. And remember, I will always love you. You mother, Kitty. I wept again for what I had lost. But when I finally ran out of tears, I returned to school and to Dot. As time passed, I graduated and was hired as an engineer at a first-rate company. I lived in Kitty's house, but rarely touched her funds, except for home upkeep and repairs. My salary covered my expenses, and my child had it taught me that I could do without a lot of the things people felt were necessary for happiness. I did dip into the funds for one thing I needed, an engagement ring. Within a year of graduating, Dot and I were engaged to be married. I began to watch people, as Miss Kitty had asked, looking for a mark. My roommate was the first. Although we rarely talked beyond pleasantries, I'd overheard enough of his phone calls to know that he was a scholarship student, and his family was dirt poor. I think he had even less of a social life than I had, since at least I dated and now had Dot. As graduation approached, he was scrambling to find lodging beyond college, and despaired that his entry-level job at a pharmaceutical company would only allow him to live in a roach-infested rat trap hotel. Neither he nor his family at the other end of the line could believe what rent in the city cost. When I realized that his job was in my hometown, I thought of Miss Kitty and cautiously asked if he'd like to continue living with me. My house has several bedrooms. Way more than I will need, I explained. Plus, I have maid and laundry services. And a cook. I kept Miss Kitty's staff. They were paid out of the trust, as they were before Miss Kitty died. Her staff was as close to family as Miss Kitty had had in her life before me. Phil, my roommate, seemed more surprised that I had talked to him than that I was offering to share my home. In the end, he was happy to take me up on my offer, and became my first real friend. Not right away, not like I'd bought his friendship, but over time we finally opened up and got to know each other. A year and a half later, when I married Dot, Phil was my best man. The marriage was a happy event for me, but a sad one as well. Dot and I were married and in love, but Phil was moving out. He was promoted and transferred to a plant on the west coast. Being a newlywed, I probably didn't miss him as much as I might have, but it still surprised me how much he'd come to mean in such a short time. He'd taken me fishing and introduced me to water skiing. We'd go out for a beer and sit out back and talk about life. I felt like I had wasted the year he was my roommate. I had a real friend. Score one for Miss Kitty. Marriage was wonderful. Dot filled my life and, with Miss Kitty's final instructions in mind, I was open to the friendships that her circle of friends offered. I pitched in to help Dot's friends Mitch and Mindy, move from one house to another, first painting and repairing the new location with Mitch, and then muscling the furniture and house goods, even driving the moving van. At the end of the day, it felt good to sit with Mitch, while Dot and Mindy rustled up dinner. I felt like I belonged. It was never really easy, though. I tended to be silent and awkward even with my new friends. I think that I would even stay physically on the edges of any grouping, unless Dot dragged me into the middle of the group. She did that more in the beginning of our marriage, but eventually gave in and let me stay at the edges of the group. In the end I did join in a lot, I think. I helped coach Little League, well, I did what my new friend Rob, the real coach, told me to do. He couldn't believe I'd never played baseball. I secretly sponsored the league's new uniforms out of trust funds. I pitched in with mops and bucket duty when the winter freeze caused burst pipes at Rick and Michelle's, got blisters digging out a retaining wall at Walters and Vivian's, just for starters. Soon I was comfortably a part of the group. I helped whenever they needed me, mostly physical labor. I had a group of friends. I was part of something beyond myself. Score another one for Miss Kitty. I'd been married for over five years when something shifted in my life. I never really noticed, so I can't say exactly when, it just crept up on me. Work was going well, I was moving up and assuming more and more responsibility as the company grew and prospered. 
I had instructed the financial group that managed what was now my trust to invest in the company, which paid off as the company's stock skyrocketed. Dot and I were happy, we had friends we partied and vacationed with, had no financial worries or pressing needs, and planned to have five kids. And we were happily working towards that goal. I had identified many marks over the years, and when I could physically help by being involved, I did and as Miss Kitty foretold, was rewarded with friendships, friendships outside of Dot's in my circle. More often, though, I help behind the scenes by dipping into the trust funds and making problems disappear. Grants and scholarships appeared at the right time, and banks were suddenly able to refinance impossible loans on generous terms. I found it rewarding to see frantic people suddenly relax and enjoy life. Dot had worked for a large financial organization right out of college, but quit with my blessing and encouragement after our marriage. She managed our home and volunteered with several charitable organizations thereafter. It kept her busy but allowed her time to pamper me, she said. We made donations to her charities every year, although in amounts in line with my earnings. I had never told her about Miss Kitty's trust. I'm not sure why, it just never seemed part of my married life. I also never told her about the marks I found per Miss Kitty's instructions, nor about the acts I took on their behalf. That just seemed private, between me and Miss Kitty. Dot did pamper me. In a way, her pampering is what I think gave me my first uneasy feelings. For the first five years of our marriage, she went out of her way to find things that I liked, that we could do together. In that sixth year, I noticed that I was out with the boys in our group, golfing, sailing, camping, fishing, one thing after another. All similar in that Dot was in part of the experience. Yes, these were things I enjoyed, and I enjoyed being in the group. But I miss my wife. Then there were outings that I wasn't included in. Maybe for good reasons, according to Dot. Ryan, you know that you don't like opera, or ballet or art galleries or poetry readings. I don't want you snoring next to me, or having you suffer all night long just to please me. Well I appreciated not having to hope the fat lady would sing soon, I miss my wife. Then there were outings that I wasn't included in. Maybe for good reasons, according to Dot. Ryan, you know that you don't like opera, or ballet or art galleries or poetry readings. I don't want you snoring next to me, or having you suffer all night long just to please me. Well I appreciated not having to hope the fat lady would sing soon, I miss my wife. When I mentioned it to Dot, she'd laugh and say, I'm right here, buddy. Just take me away to bed and I'll show you some real pampering. And our sex life would pick up for a couple of weeks, then slide back to here and there, when we were both together and not off working for the charities or me off with the boys on some adventure. Then sex became limited, as well. Dot had developed some kind of irritant in her V. That limited what we could do until it cleared up. She'd give me an occasional head, but she didn't offer that often. A hand job was her go-to thing right now. She would apologize profusely, saying that she wanted me to be happy, and she hoped this was enough for me. I loved her, didn't want her to suffer, so I told her it would do, but I hope her condition gets better soon. She assured me her doctor said it would clear up with the proper medication. I felt stupid complaining. I had a great life. Friends and a wife that loved me. A mission from Miss Kitty that gave me great satisfaction, knowing she would have loved to see the people we, she and I, were helping. I had more than I'd ever had, but I felt somehow like it was slipping away from me. Does love make everyone stupid? Dot was off to San Francisco for some charity conference. Something about fundraising, I think. As she became more involved, there seemed to be conferences and training seminars that she had to attend. I miss her when she was gone. Probably what caused my unease. But she made sure that the boys kept me busy while she was gone, with activities and get-togethers. But I missed her. Phil called me. He does that occasionally. We keep in touch sporadically when something happens in our lives. I still think of him as my first and best friend. But he seemed off, somehow hesitant on this call. Ryan, we have to talk. A chill went up my spine. I had a premonition that this wasn't good. I've learned it never is. Seems Ryan was on a temporary assignment in San Francisco, overseeing a drug test on a new product his company was developing. He'd been out for dinner and dancing with a colleague when he saw Dot at a nightclub. As he happily headed over to greet her, a tall man approached her table, leaned over to kiss Dot, and then joined her. Phil stopped, nonplussed. Then he headed back to his table. He and his colleague kept an eye on Dot that evening, as she danced with and openly kissed her date. Phil had his colleague follow them into their hotel when they left the club, even going up the elevator with them to see them both go into the same room. Phil didn't have the name of Dot's companion, but he gave me the information about the hotel and the room number. He told me how sorry he was, but he felt I had to know. In shock, I told him he'd done right, thanked him and hung up. One thing I learned from being on the road with my father. Things don't get better by ignoring them. The people who ignored things were the marks we hit most often. I had to act now, while things were going on. 
I regularly used a private investigation firm to ferret out the facts when I was helping Miss Kitty's marks. I called Dan, my contact there, as late as it was, and laid out what I needed to find out. First, I wanted him to have someone in San Francisco identify the man with Dot, and find out how long they'd been together, if possible. Was this something that happened that night, something ongoing, something on this California trip, or what? I need to know. Also, everything they can find out about the hull who was sleeping with my wife. Next, I needed someone to find out, without raising suspicions, everything about this conference. What was Dot doing there, and was this man part of it? Finally, I want surveillance on my wife, if not 24-7 as close as practicable. Was this man her only indiscretion? Suddenly, I was once again that 10-year-old thug, who trusted no one. I wanted to react like that bear Miss Kitty had seen me as. I wanted to rip off the face of Dot's lover, if indeed that's what he was. It didn't let my mind go to what I wanted to do to Dot. I think I would explode if I went there now. Dan got back to me the next day. Dot's lover, yes, that's been confirmed by the other people who travel with Dot's charity, when questioned subtly by Dan's men, was Jean Blanchard, a member of a well-known philanthropist family in our town. His family trust funded several of the charities his boards and councils Dot served on. Not surprisingly, Jean, or a whole as I think of him, was a fan of opera, ballet, art galleries and poetry readings. In fact, he fancied himself a poet and took part in quite a few poetry reading events. Turns out, he squared my wife to all these events, in the company of my friends. My friends. I pictured the bear tearing through them. I decided to take them all down. I ordered Dan to get all the evidence he could obtain of my wife's infidelity. I also asked him to investigate a hole in my friends, looking for weak points I could exploit to humiliate them or bankrupt them. Anything that I could use to disrupt their lives. Dan flat out refused to help me, beyond investigating Dots and A-Hole's association. He wouldn't try to ruin people's lives or even be involved in any investigation with that as a goal. I'm sorry man, and disappointed. I've always admired you and the good things I've seen you do, without any desire for recognition or even thanks. You're a good man. This is beneath you. I'm sorry that your wife has hurt you, but don't let it ruin you, Ryan. Please. In the end, he gave me the name of another pie, while still pleading with me to not let this destroy the person I was. I was surprised by Dan. Beyond what was necessary to convey my instructions, we'd never talked. Never anything personal. His depth of feeling shocked me. Max, the new private detective, was from a whole different type of cloth than Dan. He was more like my father than anyone I'd ever met, even as a child. I wanted to shower after our meeting. But he was what I needed at that moment. Unscrupulous was his nature, matching the viciousness that was mine. Not worried about legalities, Max managed to get phones tapped, bugs planted in homes and offices, and cameras in the Hull's apartment. Don't know how he did it, but it was expensive and worth every penny. I soon had recordings of all Dot's phone conversations and video of her liaisons with A-Hole. I was shocked to hear our friends encourage Dot to dump me and move on with A-Hole. Apparently, I had never really fit in. I was a damper who made everyone uncomfortable. A-Hole was much more the elite human that fit into their crowd. How had I ever thought that these were my friends? How had I ever been deluded by them or by Dot? Dot claimed in conversations that she had loved me when we met, and when we married, but years into a relationship, she was just worn down by my stoicism and unwillingness to embrace normal friendships and human interactions. Stoicism. Unwillingness. I thought that I had really tried, had really connected to these people. But no. Thank your husband again for spending the weekend sailing with Ryan. Dot said to one of her friends. I know it's agony for him and the boys. Her friend just laughed and replied, oh, they make it work. Ryan saved Bob a ton of money he would have had to spend digging out our retaining wall when he volunteered to do it. Some of the boys refer to Lumphead, a nickname for me I hadn't known about, as unpaid labor. Josh even got him to carry his clubs as well as his own round the course, claiming a bad back. Dot laughed appreciatively. Well, thank them for me anyway. It gives Jean and I time to really enjoy each other. I really need it, now that I've been able to convince Lumpy that a hand job is all he can expect. I get so horny that I have to get Jean to sneak away at lunch for a quickie or two. Why don't you just call it quits and marry Jean? Why all the subterfuge? Her friend asked a question that I was wondering. You've been to our house. The fantastic antiques that Miss Kitty and her family accumulated. They're priceless. I can't give that up. Lumphead doesn't appreciate those things, I don't even think he notices. Jean's been having replicates made for me, and we've been switching them out and moving the originals to his storage space. When I've gotten all the good pieces, then I can move out. Until then, I'm exercising my arm muscles with the hand jobs I give Ryan. Better than a gym. I stopped listening. I probably would never learn when I lost Dot's love or if I had ever really had it. 
I was surprised at her mercenary nature. Her paramour was wealthier than even my trust fund made me, although not as much as I would have expected. While Dot didn't know about my wealth, I'm betting that she didn't know how bad investments had diminished A. Hull's wealth. Yet, knowing she was marrying a wealthy man, she couldn't resist robbing me of Miss Kitty's prized possessions. That broke me. Knowing I was just a mark for Dot killed any feeling I had for her. Now, all I had left was viciousness. I told Dot one day that our insurance agent was worried about some of the antiques that were specifically insured by their policies. He was going to have to send out an appraiser soon to reevaluate the pieces. Dot blanched but recovered, saying really, we have valuable antiques. I never knew. I wasn't at all surprised when I was served divorce papers the following week. Dot had decided to get out while the going was good. I didn't fight the divorce at all. Dot wanted things quickly settled and was reasonable in her demands, when she found out that the house, contents and all, were part of a trust and not owned by me. Most of the investment income I had inherited was also protected, so Dot got out with a few hundred thousand. Everything else was mine or protected by the trust. Once I was free, I could be myself. Vicious. As soon as the divorce was final, Dot became Mrs. A. Hull in a big society wedding, to which all her friends went. It was the event of the year. While off on their honeymoon, videos of my wife and A-hole, in compromising positions in hotel rooms and his office, began showing up on the internet, mysteriously posted. Surprisingly, not a few videos were also posted showing A-hole another woman. He was an equal opportunity type of guy. In one video, he was ducking a 50-year-old woman on his janitorial staff. In others, he was sleeping with the college interns that work in his office. Interns of both genders. He worked for his family's company, but that didn't protect him. It was assumed that one of his enemies had made and posted the videos. I was never even suspected. He was fired from his position, and while he still received money from the trust yearly, most of his income that funded his and now Dot's lavish lifestyle, came from the overly generous salary that his family's company paid him. Dot returned from her honeymoon to find that her husband had serious cash flow problems. Her thousands from her divorce were quickly used up just covering the overhead their lifestyle incurred. My friends. No one in the entire group ever tried to contact me once Dot filed for divorce. Of course, having tapped into their phone conversations, I wasn't surprised. I had no friends. Other than Phil, that is. And Dan, who called me at least once a week, was concerned for me. That touched me more than I can say. He reminded me of Miss Kitty, making me think she would maybe not have approved of my actions. However, my friends are rather Dot's friends. I had planned to work at bankrupting them and ruining their lives with any embarrassing thing I could find on them or their families. Turns out there was plenty, but Dan and Miss Kitty had an effect on me, and I couldn't do it. In the end, I arranged for Max to have some very high class, and expensive gigolos seduce the wives, while their husbands were off on an adventure. The husbands were also seduced while on that adventure, but Max had to ensure that the prostitutes he hired for them had STDs that they hadn't yet started treatment for. I was surprised Max could supply them, but he said you'd be surprised at how many pimps kept girls working even after finding them infected. My final act in this tragedy was decided on when I found out that A. Hull had mortgaged his family home to cover his continuing lifestyle. Apparently, Dot threatened to leave him over the embarrassment of him sleeping with anything that walked, one joke in town, was that his dogs looked nervous. So he was lavishing gifts on her and making sure that her life was a continuing party. After finding out that the loan was callable, I arranged to buy it, with the trust. I had all my ducks in a row. Dot and her friends looked up, shocked as I approached their table. Hello, I smile at them. I looked at the friends. I bring greetings from, and here I listed off all the paid men and women Max had provided for them. They all turned whiter than the sheets at a KKK rally. They've asked me to inform you that you should be tested for STDs, since they all had several. In fact, the Department of Health will be calling to let you know that you've probably been infected. I turned to A-hole, my grin becoming even bigger. And this gentleman next to me is from my attorney. He's here to deliver the paperwork to you calling in the loan you took out on your property. I've bought the loan, and I'm calling it. I gestured towards the police officers who approached. Dot, these gentlemen are here for you and A-hole, I mean your husband. It seems some property was stolen from me and located in a storage space owned now by you two. Very valuable property. But you'll probably only have to serve three years or so in prison. So, the loss of your house shouldn't concern you too much. The state will take good care of you. I walked away as the officers were putting on the cuffs and reading the newlyweds their rights. I felt pretty good for someone who had lost his wife and friends. I was headed out tomorrow to the west coast to visit with Phil. He's engaged and wants me to be his best man. And his bride has a sister he wants me to meet. Dan reminds me of Miss Kitty and her desire for me to make an effort. I've decided, fuck Dot and her friends. 
I'm going to let Phil, Dan, and Miss Kitty direct me forward. That's it for today's story. Goodbye for now and stay tuned for part 2.